back. Um, we still got several of our folks that are snowed in, stuck in, um, scared in. Yeah, there's a little bit of everything. I want you guys to know how much I love being your pastor. I, you know, how many gallons of water did y'all carry to somebody whose pipes were froze this week? How many meals got delivered to folks that couldn't get in and out? How many prescriptions got delivered this week because folks couldn't get in and out? How many of you were up under somebody else's house thawing a pipe and trying to get somebody's uh, house back together and fixing, repairing broken pipes? And How many of you retrieved a car from a ditch for somebody? And... and how, Yesterday, I come up here and the parking lot was cleared. Somebody hired that in and got it done. So we're out here and we're shoveling. And I just, yeah, Mickey wanted to put the stuff in the machine this morning, so, or yesterday instead of this morning. So we showed up and I figured, well, while she's putting stuff in the computer, I'll just shovel the dry, you know, shovel some of the areas and clean them up. Before I quit, I had six other folk out there with me shoveling and clearing stuff up. They just happened to be in the neighborhood and stop by. I love y'all. That's what it, church is supposed to look like. That's how the church is supposed to act. That's how the church takes care of each other. And every one of those things that I listed are things that I've heard through the grapevine or been told by somebody or actually was a part of. Every one of those things was done for us by one of us. And I'm just so proud of the way that this church demonstrates the love of God. How this body 
is trying desperately to be all that we can be for God. And I just wanted to commend you before God this morning as we open up our time of worship. Heavenly Father, as we come into your presence, as we come in to praise your name, as we come in to honor you, as we come in to give sacrifice of praise, give sacrifice of our lives, give sacrifice of our finances, give sacrifice of all that we are because we know that everything we have is a gift of you. Lord, we come into this place to celebrate your love for each and every one of us. We come into this place to celebrate our love one for another. We come to celebrate the ability to come together and celebrate. Thank you, Lord God, for your grace, for your love, for your strength. And I pray that you would receive these coming moments as a sacrifice of praise as we offer them up to you through prayer, through song, through study, through giving and through communion. Lord God, I pray that you would be in the midst of this place. For you've told us where two or more are gathered, you're right here with us. So we know you're here. And I pray, Lord God, that we would not just recognize it, but that we would acknowledge it, that we would give you our hearts, our souls, our lives, that we would give you our all, for you are worthy of all of our praise. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. 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 Good morning. Well, happy belated Valentine's Day. Woo! Yeah. Woo. I love it. I love it. Oh, I received a Valentine. A very special one. That wasn't from Jennifer. It said in it, Michael, I love you more than you ever know. I love you when you were down. I love you when you were up. I love you through all the trials that you have been through. And I've always been there for you. You were my Valentine before you were born. And I just want you to know, I love you with the greatest love that you will ever, ever know and fathom. Signed, your father, the great I am. Thank you, Lord, for being my Valentine. Let me read a couple scriptures to you on those same lines that he talks to all of us. Get my eyes here going together. John 13, 34, and 35. A new covet I give you, love one another as I love you, so you must love one another. By this, everyone who knows that you are my disciples, if you love one another. Amen? It's kind of hard to love some people, but the Bible tells us to love one another, no matter what race, creed, what they've done and what they haven't done. Amen? Matthew 5.44 but I tell you, love your enemies and pray for them that persecute you. Corinthians, or 1 Corinthians 13, 13. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen? Message from God. That's your Valentine. He was saying it last week, even with the snow game. Amen? And he said it your whole life through. Amen. I give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good, he is above all things. And love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise. The mighty hand and an outstretched arm. His love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful.
setting sun, his love endures forever. And by the grace of God, we will care. Love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Sing praise. Forever God is faithful. Forever God is strong. Forever God is with us.
very thankful for the snow we had this week. Amen. I'm also thankful that I got all snow shoved off the porch so we didn't have to slip and walk around in it. <laughs> well, I'll take this off. Yeah. I'm afraid to, because every time I do, my hearing aids come out, my uh, glasses fall off, and this stupid string gets caught in both of them. <laughs> but anyway, I'm just so thankful that I can be here to look after some people that I love. Yeah, I'm thankful for this church as well. <clears throat> You've made me feel like I'm part of the family right from the first day that we were here. And I'm not saying that because my son's your, your leader, your pastor. He's also mine. Um, I've said several times before when he first started doing this thing, 
how in the world can a man of my age talk to my son about my problems? <laughs> I'm supposed to talk to the pastor about that. <laughs> Just so happens that he is the pastor about that. <laughs> but I still love him and I love the Lord. And I'm supposed to be talking about that. I'm supposed to be doing this thing. All right, this is time for the. Uh, um, hmm. This is time for our uh, giving of our gifts, to the Lord. Give back a portion of what He has given to us to help continue the growth of finding men and women who would say yes to Christ. So we've got two plates, one on each, each door. As you leave here this morning or this afternoon, depending on how long he preaches, uh, <clears throat> just ha half an hour? After wine, you're going to quit, right? Okay. How about how about two wines? At uh, eleven, we quit. <laughs> Anyway, so it's highs and I'll praise you back here in the back. I thank you for them. Then we come to the more precious part of the service, I think. That's giving the Lord our attention for just a few minutes. Really attending, attending to Him. Because it says in the scriptures that as they gathered together, <laughs> the Lord took a piece of bread and broke it, passed it around the room, and said, This is my body. It is given for you. So, this little thing, I think most of us have been here. I don't know if there's any new ones or not, but I appreciate you being here this morning. Um, just pull that clear one. And this one has to have a little pink on it. Pull that crack around. And let's give thanks for the body of our Lord and Savior. After he had gone around the table with the cracker, he took a cup. It had some wine in it, I guess. I'm not sure just what it was. But he says, this is my body. This is my blood shed for you for the remission of your sins that we might have a little bit better conversations. He said, remember me every time you drink of this cup. For I'm not going to drink it with you until I come back. And then we're going to have a party. So let's give some thought to what he said. Let's give some movement to what he did. Take ye and drink all of it. Trash can at the back of the by the doors as you leave to sit morning. Thank you, Lord, for your life here on earth with us, showing us just how we might have a reunion with you in our lives, how we might have our sins forgiven how we might love one another as we have partaken of the bread and the cup. Help us to remember every time we do it 
not as a ritual, but as a real thank you for what you have done in our lives. And we ask it in your, your son's holy name. Amen. couple of housekeeping issues. Uh, young people are dismissed to Children's Church at this time if they'd like to go downstairs. Uh, parents, we've got uh, good teaching downstairs for your little ones and encourage you to uh, encourage your kids and grandkids to be in church, to learn and to grow. We have a custom of letting our little bitty ones go ahead and go on into the nursery from, from start. But we want to let the older ones begin to participate in our praise and our worship. And so we ask them, the, the ones that are three and four and up, that um, they're in here. So you know what? If we get a war howl out of a kid in the middle of a song, praise God. That's what they're here to do. And the Bible says they're supposed to make a joyful noise. Uh, and that doesn't mean it's always on key or in time with the music. And that's how we teach them and we train them. I, I don't know about you, but I, I can remember Sundays. In, in our church, we had the old wooden pews like you're here in the back. And I, I was up underneath one, half of the services on Wednesday night or, or Sunday, learning and listening and hearing and being a part of what was going on, but not necessarily keeping my seat. Uh, Mom was a pianist at a church. You remember back in the 70s when they used to put skirts around the piano just in case the lady was wearing a skirt? That was my playpen. Mom would put me up under, I'd be up on the, on the podium, up underneath the piano while mom was leading praise and worship. And you know, this is where kids are supposed to be. They're part of our family. And I'm so excited that we've got some young families that are here and sharing with us. So the children are dismissed at this time. And one other piece of housekeeping, and that is the reminder none of us want, that yes, the masks are still required, especially during our singing. Um, and I was looking around as we were singing today and I saw several that had their faces uh, exposed. Remember that when you cough or sneeze that you can throw particulates up to 18 feet? It's no different than when you're singing. Now, I don't mind, it's, you know, from time to time you need that break to, to, to expose, you know, get some fresh air in there. I get that. I'm just asking you to respect those around you and continue to protect one another as I know that you love each other. How low can you go? How bad can you get before you start recognizing who God is? And what he's up to. I'll be honest with you, I have thoroughly enjoyed being snowed in uh, because I have been dissecting our next book. When we finish John here in a couple of three weeks, I'm going to take a couple of weeks to deal with some topical sermons and then we're going to dive into the book of Job. And it has been so much fun tearing Job apart and seeing what's going on in that. And I'm not going to give away any of the cookies yet, but there's some really, really good messages in Job about who is God and who are we. And so this teaching this morning parallels with that because it's a reminder of what God has done for us. And what it is that we celebrate around this table, what it is that we celebrate in the world around us. Now let's set the scene again. It's been a couple weeks because of the snow. And so I want to help you to, to as we've come through John, we're now in the 18th chapter of John. Jesus is now in custody. He's been arrested by the Pharisees, Sadducees, and the uh, leaders of the Jewish nation. He has lived out a full day Thursday, celebrated the Passover on that Thursday night with his disciples, 
taught them some really hard lessons, prophesied his death, prophesied Judas and Peter's betrayals of him, and then led the disciples through the Kidron Valley, prayed for them, prayed for us, prayed for unity, and then was arrested and drugged back up into town before Annas, before being taken to Caiaphas, who was the high priest. So that's where we're at in this story. And so now it is early Friday morning. How early? Well, I'll tell you this, the rooster has already crowed because that was Peter's story. So we're coming into this Friday morning as we pick up in verse 28. Then the Jews led Jesus from Caiaphas to the palace of the Roman governor. By now it was early morning, and to avoid ceremonial uncleanliness, the Jews did not enter the palace. They wanted to be able to eat the Passover. I'm going to stop right here and unpack this. John doesn't tell us anything of the trial before Caiaphas. We got the trial before Annas just a few verses ago, and when we get to verse 24, he says, then Annas sends Jesus bound to Caiaphas, and then we pick up in verse 28, and Caiaphas is sending him to Pilate. We have no idea what happened from John's perspective of what went on with Caiaphas between verses 24 and 28. But I want to talk to this idea of ceremonial uncleanness. The Jews had become so racist that they taught that even to enter the home or to be touched by a non-Jew, by a Gentile, to associate with them or to, to visit with them at all would make one unclean. You, you couldn't go before God. You had been defiled. You were completely unclean. And this is even borne out as we get into the book of Acts by Peter and Cornelius. When Cornelius, a Gentile, calls for Peter because God tells him to, Peter is shown the, the tarp that comes down from heaven with unclean foods on it three times. And as we get into Acts chapter 10 and verse 28, Peter says to this household of Cornelius, you are well aware that it is against our law for a Jew to associate with a Gentile or to visit him. But God has shown me that I should not call any man impure or unclean. And so there was this huge misunderstanding because God in the law that he gave to Moses never said anything about stay away from the Gentiles. What he said was, don't make alliances. Don't marry with them. Don't become unequally yoked. Don't put yourself in some form of intercourse with these neighbors of yours that are going to obligate you as a Jew into idolatrous practices. He said, these are the people who need redemption. You're my witnesses to the world. You're supposed to be a peculiar people. These folks are out here doing the wrong thing. Don't engage in the wrong thing with them. But engage them. Bring them in. There's, there's all kinds of real uh, reasons and realities that a Gentile could become a Jew. They could join the Israeli nation. They could become, and we get those stories in Rahab and in Boaz. We've got so many different stories in the scripture where someone on the outside became someone on the inside long before Jesus. And that was the whole point, that God was saying, don't let them influence you. Instead, you influence them. Go out there and influence them. But the Jewish leadership had taken the implication and used it to exclude Gentiles, exclude non-Jews entirely. So that's what John is getting at, is here are these religious leaders who want to see Jesus killed, but they can't kill him because that's against the law. Only a Roman can kill and so these Jews can't exercise their law and kill Jesus like they want to. They have to get the Romans to do it. And so they have to go talk to Pilate because he's the governor. He's the jurisprudence in the area. He's the guy that gets to condemn Jesus. But they've got a problem. It's Friday morning. 
of Passover week. And if they go into his house, they're defiled. They are unclean and would remain so until evening and, and had a chance to cleanse themselves. Which means that for that entire day, because it's already early morning, it's, for that entire day, they would be excluded from all rituals. These are the high priests. These are the leaders who would now be excluded from leading in these various different services. So it'd be like showing up for church and, and the minister isn't there. Can't be because I've been defiled. And so here's these huge opportunities for these guys to lead their people in worship in the coming hours. But if they go into Pilate's place now, they won't be able to because of these man-made laws. Now Passover was immediately followed by the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's called an octave. It's an eight-day festival. You get day one is Passover, and then you get the seven-day Feast of Unleavened Bread. So Friday morning would be the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread because they'd celebrated Passover the night before on Thursday. So what's not going on here is it's not that Jesus had his ceremony the night before because a lot of people get confused at this because they see, wait a minute, the, the, the Jewish leaders don't want to go in because they want to eat the Passover. Well, you have to understand that culturally, this entire octave, this entire eight days, both Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread were referred to as the Passover by this point in Jesus, in, in, in human history, by the time of Christ. And so for them to not be able to eat the Passover was any of the other feasts that were going on, and there's some major ones on day one of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. It's called a feast for a reason. And so they didn't want to miss out on all of the feasting and all of the celebrating and all that was going on with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. They wanted to partake in that, and if they went into Pilate's chamber, they had darkened the doorway of a Gentile. They were now unclean and couldn't. So they stand on the outside. Get this. Can you just see this? All of the religious leaders in the state of Arkansas walking down to the capital in Little Rock and demanding the governor come out and talk to us. And we're not coming in there. Y'all heathen. We know the people that voted for you. I ain't coming in there. How's that going to play out? But that's exactly what happens here as we pick up in verse 29. So Pilate came out to them and asked, what charges are you bringing against this man? Their answer? If he were not a criminal, they replied, we would not have handed him over to you. <laughs> Did that answer my question? Take him yourself. Judge him by your own law. But we have no right to execute anyone, the Jews objected. This happened so that the words Jesus had spoken indicating the kind of death he was going to die would be fulfilled. You see, here what we've got going on in this story is a power struggle of equal leaders. You don't think of it this way because you may not know the culture of the day, but the reality is, is the high priest was a position appointed by Rome. The governor of the territory was a position appointed by Rome. So both the high priests and Pilate are answerable to Rome, and both of them are charged with the same job, keep the peace. Because the last thing they want is a revolt in Israel. The, 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 Jew, or the Romans have, have quashed down a couple of different revolts. Pilate's crushed down a few revolts that have gone on. Pilate's whole job is to keep a riot from happening. But because the high priest is an appointed position, Rome exercised a lot of pressure on them to keep the peace too. Which is why the Jews want Jesus dead. He's stirring up the people. He's creating a conflict. It's not just that he's after our job. It's not just that he's trying to rewrite the scriptures. It's not just that he's threatening our position. It's that if these people, you saw what they did last Sunday. Palm Sunday, they hailed him as a king. 
What do you think Tiberius is going to think of that? We've got to stop this guy. Because if he starts a revolt, Pilate's going to be coming after us. Rome's going to be coming after us. We've already got a garrison sitting here. And, oh, by the way, Pilate, when he comes to town, brings an army with him. Pilate wasn't always in Jerusalem. Now, so you've got these two political groups charged with keeping the peace. But let's be honest, these are two, two totally different agendas. The high priests would love to get rid of Rome and are doing everything they can to subvert Rome, but keeping a happy face while doing it. Pilate has gotten the worst command a, 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 a general could get. Uh, he, nobody, nobody wants to be at the garrison at Jerusalem. That's not a position of honor. He, he would rather be in some other garrison, in some other community, where he was able to demonstrate his leadership and, and get himself in the political row to, to move up the ladder, maybe even into the Senate. This is not their first rodeo with one another. I was reading this morning through the historical writers, both Philo and Josephus, talk about multiple events where Pilate and the Jews were in conflict in Jerusalem. They were equally offensive to one another as often as they could be. They were gouging one another all the time. <clears throat> I didn't have a brother or sister. I'm an only brat. But I've watched others with siblings, and I have noticed that there are probably no more vindictive siblings than twins. Equal status, equal place, they even look like each other. You know what I'm saying? They're on each other all the time. Well, that's literally what's going on politically between the high priest and the governor of Jerusalem. These guys are twins, and they just enjoy sitting in the back seat, pestering each other, and making the parents in Rome go, don't make me come down there. I'll stop this chariot. Yeah. And so nobody wants Tiberius to stop the car and come to Jerusalem. Because that means that the high priest is fired, and Pilate is fired. They're done, because their job to keep the peace. But they're egging each other. You can see the conflict in these verses. You know, why did you bring him here? I told you he was guilty. Just condemn him. Wait a minute. I don't take your word for Jack. What did he do? I mean, you can just hear these two going back and forth at each other. And Pilate had only just arrived the previous week. As a matter of fact, on Palm Sunday. Uh, historically, we believe that when Jesus is coming in through the eastern gate and everybody is proclaiming him king, was the exact same moment that Pontius Pilate and the army were arriving at the western gate. That these two forces were coming into Jerusalem at the same time. Neither of them aware of the other. So Pilate's only just gotten in town. He doesn't want to, but he likes to be up Tel Aviv. <laughs> he prefers much more. Re How many of you guys would prefer to rule from the beach? You know what I'm saying? I'm not going up on the mountain. I'm going to stay down here at the beach. It's a whole lot more fun. So he would stay down and, and only come to Jerusalem when there was one of these festivals because he has to play the cop. He knows full well there's going to be protests. He knows full well there's going to be riots. And it's his job to make sure that nothing gets back to Rome. And Rome really doesn't care how he does it. So he's just in town to monitor the festival control the crowd. He does not anticipate that the one that's going to stir the pot is the high priest. So it's caught him flat-footed at this point. He does not anticipate the Sadducees and the Pharisees to be the ones at his front gate. He expected it would be some zealot or somebody else like Barabbas. Honestly, he just wants us to go away. Just deal with it. Try him by your own law. Make it happen. Go away. But the Jews are going to make this an issue. And they make it the issue because under Roman law, a conquered people could not kill. The death penalty was reserved for the Roman courts because the Romans believed that they were the only ones that had a fair court. 
And so they weren't going to let some local tribe kill somebody over some local law. It had to get to the point that the Romans went, yeah, that is pretty bad. Go ahead and kill him. So capital punishment was re refused to anyone other than the Roman procurator. And so that's why they've come to him. That's why they've woken him up this morning. That's why they're messing with him right in the middle of the first day of this celebration. Pick up in verse 33. I'm sorry. 32. Pilate then went back inside the palace summoned Jesus and asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Is that your idea? Jesus asked. Or did others talk to you about me? Am I a Jew? Pilate replied. It was your people and your chief priests who handed you over to me. What is it you have done? Jesus said, My kingdom is not of this world. If it were, my servants would fight to prevent my arrest from the Jews. But now my kingdom is from another place. <laughs> so you are a king then, said Pilate. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I am a king. In fact, for this reason I was born and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. Everyone on the side of the truth listens to me. What? is truth Pilate asked what is truth you know it's interesting to me that John does not record anywhere in the verses 29 through 32 anything about anybody saying Jesus was a king and yet that's the first question Pilate has so obviously John is not giving us the full record. He's just hitting the high points of these conversations between these key players because the one thing that bothers Rome is insurrection. You see, the whole issue here is not whether he claims to be this or whether he claims to be that, whether he has 50 followers or 500 followers. They don't care until you start to challenge the government. And at that point, we have a problem. So Pilate's only concern, he doesn't care about any other, other material that is coming out of the high priest's mouth. The only thing that he pings on is, wait a minute, this guy's claiming to be a king. There is only one, and that is the emperor. That is the Caesar. So he goes straight to the heart of the matter, and he says, are you a king? Jesus answers, yes, I am a king, but not in a way that threatens either you or Rome. My followers aren't from around here. If they were, they'd already be attacking your gate. You see anybody? Man, I've got 12 disciples, 72 followers, and 120 outside group. Who's standing at the door currently? Anybody? Anybody? Don't you think, dude, if I grabbed you by the shirt and started dragging you out of here, how many of your soldiers would come out of that garrison? Yeah, I'm a king. But I'm not a king in the way you understand. I am the king of truth. I rule truth. Pilate's dumbfounded by this. What? is truth. Now, that's a sorry state of affairs that you have a leader, a procurator over an area that does not know what truth is. This is not just a philosophical question. This is a down to the heart of the matter issue. And it's a sorry state of affairs, not just for Pilate, but for us as well today. It lingers even still among our culture. It lingers even still among our communities. How many of us have heard people say silly things like, your truth and my truth? Truth that is situational rather than absolute. 
Truth that is fact, not opinion. You know, it's interesting. I was reading something here this last week where someone had done a study and they brought out the idea that people 49 and younger seem to be in this modern day better at identifying fact versus opinion than those who are 50 and older, which I thought was condemning. At least we taught them how to do it, but why aren't we? You know, why is it that we don't recognize the difference between fact, truth, and opinion, what I want? You see, what's going on here is this collective idea of is truth a universal or is truth just cultural? Is truth absolute or is truth just situational? And I would love to get into the whole apologetics of that and then someday I may come back and, and preach a whole sermon on this topic. But just understand For those of you who love philosophy, you'll enjoy this one just for 30 seconds. To say that there is no absolute truth is an absolute truth. Philosophically, to make the statement, there is no absolute truth, is an absolute statement that you believe to be true. Therefore, it is an absolute truth. So you've just argued yourself under your own table. What is truth? Anybody remember a passage that said something along the lines of fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom? You see, the reality is it's not just a bumper sticker. It's a reality. Jesus Christ is the King of truth. If you know Jesus, you know truth. If you don't know Jesus, you don't know truth. The world around us, <laughs> fake news ain't new. The serpent, Satan, Lucifer, the devil, pick your title is spoken about all the way through this beautiful book as a lying deceiver and the prince of this world. This world is based on a lie. This world's governments are based on lies. This world's viewpoints are based on lies. This world's policies and procedures and approaches and goals and agendas are all based on lies. Which leaves every one of us sometimes wondering, what is truth? It's tough. We'll come back to that some other time. Picking up in verse 38. With this, he went out again to the Jews and said, I find no basis for charge against him. But it is your custom for me to release to you one prisoner at the time of Passover. Do you want me to release the king of the Jews? And they shouted back, No, not him. Give us Barabbas. Now Barabbas had taken part in rebellion. And Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. The soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe and went up to him again and again saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And they struck him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. You see, Pilate recognizes real quick that there is no threat to Jerusalem 
in Jesus. There is no threat to Judea, the area that he is proconsul over in Jesus. There is no threat to Rome in Jesus. Therefore, by Roman law, there is nothing with which this governor has to accuse this man. He hasn't stolen, he hasn't killed, he hasn't stirred up an insurrection, he hasn't threatened Rome, he's never... There is no charge against this man that would even get him arrested, much less killed. Go away. And so Pilate tries to negotiate a solution. <coughs> Excuse me. That won't strike against his conscience or his legal responsibilities and will also bring peace to this situation. He's like, look, look, I, I get it. You guys are mad at this dude, and I, I don't know why, but okay. So I tell you what. Every year at Passover, you guys have me do a forgiveness act. I think it's stupid, but hey, it keeps the peace. So of all of the people I have in prison, which one shall I release to you? I would suggest this guy. Because he's done absolutely nothing wrong. I don't even have a charge to hold him, much less imprison him. But instantly, the crowd begins to scream back, no, give us Barabbas, give us Barabbas. There's some historical commentary on this that it's entirely possible, but the guy that got released was also named Jesus. Bar Abbas is what we would refer to as a last name. Bar is son. Abbas is father. So Barabbas is literally son of the father. The dude named his kid. That's my boy. You got to love it. Jesus would have been known as Bar Joseph because it was thought that he was the son of Joseph. So he would have been known in his community as Jesus Bar Joseph. Jesus, the son of Joseph. So all we know about this guy is that he's named after his dad. He's Bar Abbas. And so historians have, have given some conversation over the last 2,000 years of, was it that Barabbas was actually named Yeshua or, Joseph or um, Jesus or um, Joshua? It's the same name. And, and so to keep them <laughs> separated, they were like, because if everybody started going, give us Jesus, they'd be like, good. He's like, no, 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 give us the other one, Barabbas. <laughs> trying to get Jesus condemned. And Pilate recognizes at this point there's blood in the water and the sharks need fed. And so he goes to the next level. Okay, fine, we'll release Barabbas to you. Take him back in the hallway. I got it. I know what I'll do. I'll punish him. That will satisfy the Jews and they'll go away. I will bring him under full punishment as though he had done something, but I'm not going to be responsible for this man's life. I'm not killing him. So, go punish him. Now, perhaps Pilate underestimated how much the garrison despised being in Jerusalem. Maybe he'd forgotten how much the Romans hated being in Jerusalem and Judea. Maybe he'd forgotten for half a second that the soldiers that he had wanted to nuke the whole place and turn it into a glass parking lot. Or perhaps not. Both Philo and Josephus speak to the character of Pilate as being a very capricious, violent, ruthless, and cruel man. So he looks over at his commanding sergeant. Punish him. Flog him. Now, I want you to understand at the outset of this, <laughs> Rome does not have a war crimes tribunal. 
They do not care how they kill you. They do not care how often they kill you. They don't care how many ways they can kill you. Rome was the kind of place that would try to kill you and get you right to that edge of dead and then bring you back and then kill you again because they didn't care. If you were on a battlefield, they'd just slaughter you. Jesus, or Paul, talks about the idea of having feet that are shod in the preparation for peace. He's referencing the fact that Roman soldiers, when they went into battle, wore sandals that had spikes that were up to three or four inches thick, so that as they were slaughtering in the battlefield, they wouldn't slip in the blood and the guts. They could just stomp on the bodies that were there and let the cleats give them some traction in the people they were killing. The Romans don't care. They are not a police force. They are not a sane government. These are individuals who are serving, who get paid for the number of bodies they stack up. They don't care. And oh, by the way, they hate the Jews. And so when they get this guy back into the back holes of the palace, I want you to spank this guy. What for, boss? King of the Jews. This is the king. This, this is the dude that actually represents all of them. <laughs> it's on. And so these garrison soldiers who will not face war crimes tribunal, who will not be punished for going too far or being too excessive, flog him. Now you have to understand that under the law, flogging was a death sentence. Forty lashes, and that's not with a wet noodle. It's with a cat of nine tails, a lash that was braided together into a handle made out of nine pieces of leather in which were embedded bone and stone and glass and anything else they could find that was sharp so that when they hit you with it it would sink into the skin and they could twist it so it would get a good bite and then jerk chunks of flesh off of you this is not now you go behave <laughs> they got one guy, I swear to you, there's a guy in the back room that has an arm like this. Because he just loves this. Wow. Forty times. Over and over and over. And in between lashes, oh, the rest of the group doesn't want to miss out because they don't get to swing the lash. So they look around and they start finding some, some robe for him. There was, where, man, Pilate's got to have one. Of, hey, go get the centurion's cape. And they bring it out and they throw it on his back. Hail, king of the Jews. <laughs> oh, wait, 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 wait. King needs a crown. Have you ever seen a hawthorn tree? You ever seen those trees that have those spikes on them? They're about yay long. I was going to cut one out, but I couldn't get to it in the snow. I got one out in my yard. You take that and you twist it and you braid it into itself and you have this thing that has spikes everywhere. It's like irritating a porcupine. Okay, it just spikes everywhere. Well, you jam that down onto the head and it pierces and it penetrates, but it won't hurt. You don't go through the skull. That's bone. That needle's not going to hurt it. But all of the skin around it begins to swell. So now it's stuck. You can't pull it back off again because the skin has begun to swell out around it and the bleeding. Have you ever had a facial wound? Those suckers bleed like crazy. And so they're, they've got this thing jammed on him and they're smacking him with the, the whip and they're putting the thing on him. And you ever stop and realize that after they've hit you 40 times and your hamburger, when they put a piece of cloth on you, it acts a lot like a Band-Aid? And then they would grab it and tear it back off and hit him some more. And then they'd put him on it and they would take it off and be... This man was a piece of walking hamburger by the time he comes back out. So when Pilate says, here is the man, 
It's because the very people that handed him over just some little time earlier couldn't recognize him. This is the man you gave me. There, I beat him. Go away. Verse 6. As soon as the chief priests and the officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! And Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, We have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid and went back inside the palace. The chief priests and officials are set on Jesus' crucifixion. There is no way he lives through this day. If Pontius Pilate kicks him out into the street, one of them will knife him. Jesus is not getting off the hook. They have already decided that he should die. They will not take no for an answer. And they finally admit, you know, when we started this thing, he was like, what did he do? He's guilty, just condemn him. Wait, no, what did he do? Ah, they finally get around to admitting, no, this is about a Jewish thing. This is not a Roman one. Okay, great. So what did he do that irritated you guys so bad? He claimed to be God. Dude, what if he is? How did you just set me up? He claimed to be the Son of God? Now that may not seem much to us in our scientific world today, but do you have any idea how many gods there were in the Roman pantheon? Do you have any idea how many different of the gods showed up in mortal form in Roman religion? Pilate ain't a Jew. Pilate's a Roman. Pilate's belief system is different than theirs. So the idea that a God might show up as a man is not a weird thing. What have you just made me do? So he's afraid. He goes back in. Where do you come from? He asked Jesus. But Jesus gave him no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have the power to either free you or to crucify you? Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. Where do you come from, O King of Truth? Where is this kingdom of yours? How is it that you know truth? How is it that you understand these things? Please tell me you're not who they just said you are. Where did you come from? And Jesus remains absolutely silent. I think, and this is just me, I think it was to prevent gaining an ally. You realize that one encouraging word from Jesus and Pilate would have slaughtered the high priest. But you see, these things had to come to pass. Jesus knows if he says an encouraging word to Pilate, Pilate is going to defend him. Pilate will call out the garrison. Pilate will not let this evil thing happen. And so he remains silent because he doesn't want Pilate on his team. He needs Pilate to kill him because the Father sent him to die for us. And the only way he accomplishes his mission is if we kill him. 
And so he remains silent. And Pilate recognizes what's being done here. Pilate recognizes that he has no authority. You realize at this point, he's no longer in charge of his own courtroom. He is asking questions of a man, not as an authority, but as a seeker. Who are you? Where did you come from? And so he's reduced to just playing the authority card because I said so. You ever get there as a parent? You know? You really don't have a decent argument and so you just throw the authority card because I said so. Do you not realize, and I want to put this in slightly different words because I think it carries the meaning a little clearer, but here's what Pilate really said to Jesus. Do you realize I hold the power of life and death over you? I decide whether you walk away or whether you die. I have the power of life and death over you. Well, friend, you're speaking to the God of truth. <laughs> and Jesus stomps him with truth. You are God's servant. So wait a minute, that's not in that verse. Certainly it is. Look at what he says. You have no power over me except that it's been given to you from above. The only authority you have over me is the fact that God has put you here in this time to do this act because this is what's required. You're not in control. You are sinning. Your sin is injustice. But the sin of betraying God and His Messiah is an even greater sin that rests at the feet of the ones that turned me over to you. Do what you need to do. I'm not after you. It's them that brought me to you that are guilty of the greater sin. So, now we get to verse 12. Pilate hears this. He brings Jesus out I'm sorry. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free. <laughs> but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. And when Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which in Aramaic is Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of Passover week, about the sixth hour. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked. We have no king but Caesar. The chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. The emotion wells up in me because here in this moment, Pilate is once again trying desperately to make this go away. And it's at this point that the Jews play their political trump card. What the Bible doesn't explain to us that we get out of the historical writings of Rome is that Pilate... Let me back up. In Rome, you only got somewhere by going on somebody else's coattails. You had to have a benefactor. And as long as that benefactor was... So you have the, the, the emperor has his circle of people that he relies on. And each of those people have people that they're trying to put into... You know, graft has always existed. You know, hey, we'll vote for you if you let my little brother serve on... And so you only got places in Roman politics by who you knew. And what had happened about 15 years earlier, and the reason that Pilate was in Jerusalem, is that Pilate's benefactor was an individual that was in the close arena to the emperor. And he displeased the emperor. And so Pilate lost his benefactor. 
But because Pilate was not engaged in the activity that the benefactor was engaged in, he doesn't get punished. He doesn't get killed. The benefactor gets killed. Pilate gets sent to Jerusalem, shoved off in the armpit of the Roman Empire. Just go away. The interesting thing is that in all of the Roman writings, the charge that was leveled against Pilate's benefactor is that he was no friend of Caesar. The chief priests knew this because they had their own political dealings in Rome. And so they knew this was close to home. They knew what they're saying to him is, you are no friend of Caesar. I am going to write a letter to Rome that accuses you of treason. I will take you out the same way your benefactor was taken out some years ago. I will report that there was an insurrection that we had to put down because you failed to. That's why Pilate, the most powerful man in Jerusalem, acquiesces. He backs off. I think he proves his point. And when he presents Jesus, he says, Here is your king. <laughs> if somebody beat me to a bloody pulp, how many of you would be angry? Thank you. I'm not going to ask that question the other way. I don't want to know. He's just beat this guy to a bloody pulp and he stands him out there and he goes... Here's your king. Anybody's leader that got treated like that, his people would come out of the woodwork. No one rushes to Jesus' aid. If he's such an insurrectionist, you chief priest, where's his people? If he's leading something to overthrow the Roman Empire, where are they? Where is the mob? The only mob I see is you. Calling for his death. Stirring up the people. Nobody's following. If he's the king, why is nobody following him? If he's a threat to Rome, where's all his followers? Here's your king. Will anyone rally to this man? Because otherwise your accusation is meaningless. By the way, Rome had appointed a king over Judea. His name was Herod. And he shows up in the story too. So Pilate here is absolutely affronting Herod. Here is your king when he knows full well Herod's three blocks down in his own palace. They already had a king of the Jews. His name was Herod. This guy, if anybody's a threat, he's a threat to Herod. He's not a threat to me. He's not a threat to Rome. So here's your king. He denies the power of their own accusations against him and says, I won't have anything to do with this. Shall I crucify your king? You want me to kill a man that you don't follow while you accuse him of being a king that nobody's following. And it's at this point that the chief priest violates every principle of his office, violates every single mandate that has ever been put on a man of God to lead a people. It is at this moment that he gets to what is the low point in all the history of the nation of Israel. The lowest point. We have no king but Caesar. The law of God refused to allow them to worship a man. The law of God warned them against having a king and using that king to replace him. This man is not even a Jew. 
He's the Roman emperor. The one man in all of Jerusalem, the one man in all of Israel who should have stood up and said, we will do what is right before God. And that would be to kill this man. That would have been the right statement. But no, this man says, we, the people of Israel, reject God for the Roman Empire. We have no king but Caesar. They've completely abandoned God. They've completely abandoned the lordship of God. They have directly violated the law of Moses. How low can you go? They violated Jewish law. They violated Roman law. They've held a kangaroo court. They have blackmailed Pilate. They have murdered the Messiah and they have rejected God. How, how low can you go? And I want to speak historically for just a moment to the idea of why some of the early church fathers spoke so vehemently against the Jews and why some of the later Middle uh, Ages German theologians, their writings were so anti-Semitic, and they were. There's, there's nothing to hide there. They were absolutely anti-Semitic because they failed to understand that this was not a Jewish issue. The Jews did not kill Jesus. Our sin did. The Gentiles didn't kill Jesus. Our sin did. It wasn't the act of man. It was an act of God. You see, what the early theologians and early church fathers lost sight of in their anger at the Jews for killing their leader was that this was not a them issue. It's their fault. No, it's an us issue issue. It's actually an all of us issue. To put this in perspective, to have an accurate understanding of what's going on in this scene, you have to come to a point where, you have, where you're able to say, I am Caiaphas. I am the one who betrayed my God, who betrayed his Messiah, who betrayed the law, who betrayed all things when I chose sin, when I chose pleasure, when I chose me to be on the throne. I am Caiaphas. Romans chapter 5. Verses 6 through 11, Paul captures this and gives us something that brings us to the fireworks of the reality of what's happening in this scene. In chapter 5 of Romans, picking up in verse 6, Paul writes, You see, just the right time, when we were still powerless, <laughs> you have no power except that it's given unto you by the... While we were yet powerless... Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates His own love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Woohoo! Dry those tears up, friends. They should be tears of joy, not tears of remorse. The reality is, while we were still sinning, while we were yelling crucify, while we said we had no king but Caesar, Jesus died to pay that penalty for us. Even in the midst of our sin, he didn't wait for us to clean ourselves up. Friends, if you think you can clean yourself up enough to get God on your side, you miss the point of the cross. If we could do that, Jesus doesn't need to die. The reality is, He 
has given us this gift because of his love for us. And since we have now been justified by his blood, <laughs> how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through death of his son, how much more having been re reconciled shall we be saved through his life? Not only is this, this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation Guys, do you get what Paul is helping us with here? Do you understand that Jesus' silence in front of Pilate was so that Pilate would kill him so that he could redeem Pilate? He did not die on the cross mocking Caiaphas. He died on the cross shedding his blood to atone for Caiaphas. The fact that Jesus died even while we were sinners, now that we are reconciled to him, if he loves us enough to die for us when we suck, how much more will he give himself to us now that we are sons and daughters? The thing about Jesus in this scene with Pilate is that he could have declared his kingship, his ownership of the world. And that would have only demonstrated his love for himself. Jesus demonstrated his love for us. And that while we were jacked up and still doing the wrong things, He saved us anyway. If He loves us enough to do that, now that we are sons and daughters, now that we can cry out to Him, Abba, Father, now we can crawl up. You get this? You get to crawl up into the lap of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. You get to come up to the Master of the Universe and wrap your arms around Him and give Him a great big old hug. That is why He finishes. This is what we get. Not only all of this, but it's why we get to rejoice in God through Christ. We've been reconciled, not of ourselves, but of His death, His atonement, His blood. And so we can celebrate. Dad was talking earlier at the time of communion about Jesus saying, look guys, I'm not going to have any wine until I come back because then it's going to be a serious party. <laughs> I want you to go back to Jesus' teaching of the prodigal son. What does the old man do when the boy comes home? I cannot wait to see the God of all the universe, Father God in all of His glory, rise up off of His throne and run to the city gate to wrap His arms around me and throw a ring on my finger and throw a robe on my back and to kill the fatted calf and to celebrate and to have a feast that will last for eternity. Heaven isn't about golden streets and big buildings. Heaven is about being in that relationship with Jesus Christ forever. Heaven is all about this beautiful, eternal hug that we get from the love of God. How low can you go? God's love went deeper. And He pulled you out of a miry clay and set your feet on a rock. Celebrate that reality. You may be here this morning and may not be in a relationship with Christ. You may not have a clue in the world what I'm talking about. The only thing you know is the torture and the torment of your own sin, your own grief, your own background, your own junk. And you're like, dude, I don't even get what you're talking about. How could anybody love me? You don't know what I've done. Yes, God does. And he died for you anyway. He died for you anyway. It's already forgiven. The only difference is you haven't claimed it. You can do that today. If you have not yet claimed Christ as your own, it's that simple. Lord, I'm jacked up. I need help. You're the helper. I'm yours. That's it. And when we receive that forgiveness, we then get all of the celebration of the pleasure of a merciful and loving God. Bow your heads with me. Heavenly Father, as we close out this service, I don't want to quit. 
There is so much that could be said in your glory. There could be so much said to say of your honor and of who you are and what you've done and what you continue to do. How great is your love for us? How deep and profound is the gift that you have given to us? You love us beyond what we understand. We confuse love with lust. We confuse love with warm feelings. We confuse love with, as long as you're convenient to me, I'll be liking you. But you demonstrate your love in this while we are yet sinners. You die for us. You reconcile us to yourself even in the midst of our sin. If you love us enough to go into that dark place to pull us out, how much more will you love us in the light? Lord God, help us to remember who we are and whose we are that we might fully celebrate as you would have us to celebrate, that we might be that remorseful until we are forgiven and that we would remorse no more. For you are not a God of shame. You are not a God of regret. You are a God of reconciliation. You are a God of redemption. You are a God of praise. You are a God of adoration. You are a God of love and mercy and grace. And we give you glory and honor and thanksgiving because of it. We stand this morning and we shout your name. We proclaim you to the heavens. We give you all glory and honor and praise and thanksgiving. For you alone are love and you alone are God. And we are yours. Amen. May the God of all love and peace, the God who reached into the miry pit and drew you up into everlasting light, give you joy, peace, strength, restoration, redemption. May your body know healing. May your mind know clarity. May your spirit know peace that comes only from the Father. Amen. Amen.